Okay. Uh, hi, folks. Uh, I'm glad to see you on our weekly seminar. And today we are going to go through the paper about counterfactual generative networks. Uh, so in my opinion, it's one of the great papers from last ICLR conferences, uh, which went unnoticed, relatively unnoticed. So maybe it's because it goes from less popular more academic background and wasn't hyped up by its authors, but uh, turns out it has a lot of interesting insights and a lot of uh, topics that we can discuss around it. So let's start and see where it gets us. Okay, uh, first uh, I want to start with an example and example is mostly about uh, causal classification. So, uh, let's uh, look at this picture of a cow and let's uh, uh, let's imagine we are using some uh, vanilla classifier to classify the class object here. Uh, as you can see, we can already uh, see the distribution of logits. And uh, we can now face the issue of uh, causal correlation here. So uh, the thing is that uh, in the most data sets, most likely uh, the cows would be uh, introduced on a green background with pasture and such. And it, and it seems like it is an easy way for a, a neural network for your classifier to draw false correlation here between uh, the class object and the background which it's on. So if we look at the example in a like expected setting, we have quite high probability of a cow. But if we, for example, set a different background, it turns out the cow is all of a sudden a seahorse, which is quite funny, I think. And even if uh, we don't necessarily break the classifier, uh, we can get less uh, precise predictions. Like here, we get a mammal uh, instead of the cow, and we have a, a little lower uh, probability density on this point. Uh, so these types of correlations, uh, which uh, draw us to false conclusions, are called spiral correlations. And you can think about them as, oh, like, we really consider correlation false if for example, we can get our object, uh, if it's not necessarily describes our object, if we can get rid of it and still describe our object correctly. So for example, background uh, doesn't have like meaningful correlation with uh, cow class, but for example, number of legs or, I don't know, or uh, shape of a cow does. So it's, it's actually a lot of different data set biases, not necessarily in classification tasks and even not necessarily in visual recognition. So we can see a lot of examples here uh, as we saw the example with uh, like background. And this is a example from different, from completely different paper. So we, we sometimes have uh, examples which are which remind us closely to adversarial examples, which break our classifiers, or even we can have uh, some bias introduced in our text classifiers. So for example, uh, our question answering model uh, is used to draw its decision looking at only the last sentence instead of the context. And this is also like a problem. Okay, and let's uh, go and try to describe our problem in a causal framework. So basically this image doesn't uh, represent exactly my point. So if you follow the link in the paper, uh, it's a little bit more general paper about causal mechanisms uh, in machine learning in general. But uh, what I'm trying to say that uh, we want to make some assumptions and from that assumptions, we want to introduce some framework of causal generation. Uh, for which we will find use later. And maybe it will help us to deal with our causal correlation problem, maybe it won't. So 
let's let's imagine we have different independent mechanisms. Independent mechanisms is uh, determined from uh, theory of causality, but basically you can think about it as, as a mechanism which uh, corresponds to some factor of variation. Uh, so for, for in our example, it could be like shape of the cow. So let's say shape of a cow or like any animal or let's say background. Uh, in fact, uh, to be completely honest, this uh, like factor separation could be like dependent on each other. But sometimes you can see the dependence between shape and the color, or maybe we introduce more complex uh, independent mechanisms. But for the sake of simplicity and in general for this particular paper, we make the assumption that those concepts are independent in each other. And from like that concepts, we get somehow an image and we pass that image to the image classifier. And we'll go with classification tasks throughout all this presentation as a simplest example. I think we we'll, won't have any problems with it. Uh, yeah, so once more, I want to mention the authors of the paper. So uh, in fact, I will reference a lot of the papers along the way, and I'll try to add references to all the images I use, but you can assume in general, if you see some plot or image, which you believe I didn't draw myself, by default, it goes from this paper, which is the center of our discussion today. Okay. So let's uh, let's set our final goal, what we're trying to achieve. So uh, what do we have in with our vanilla visual classification test? We have classification, like image for classification, we have a classifier, right? And it classifies our bird as an ostrich. And it doesn't actually, uh, taking into consideration any independent mechanisms, any factors of variation of this ostrich. And if, as, as in the example with the cow, if we set ostrich in some uh, different background, it can really skew our predictions in a bad way. So what we're trying to achieve, let's say instead of one classifier, we'll have three classifiers here, each of which uh, is drawing its decision uh, like looking at a single factor of variation. And then we will use this uh, ensemble as an uh, ensemble for decision-making. Decision and we hope that this approach will improve our robustness to some false correlations. So that's our ultimate goal. Uh, and one of the goals of this paper. So let's see what we are proposing. So, uh, you know, when you go through every paper uh, and in the last years, each paper has its like main figure. So if I had to spend only five minutes to take a look at the paper, I will most likely read through the abstract and look at the main image. And you can usually tell which image captures the essence of the paper. And this is that exact image. So it uh, describes the architecture of counterfactual generative network. And this is our framework for generating counterfactual images. So yeah, maybe I, I did mention before. So what is actually a counterfactual image is an image uh, in which factors of variation are combined in some uh, unseen way. So for example, if we see an ostrich underwater, so it would be weird or on some different background or with some different color, but we still, but it is still an ostrich. So it's uh, still uh, like a valid factor. And we actually want to uh, set up a framework to generate some, such images. And yeah, it would be like another GAN, but it's a bit more complex than that. So uh, let's take like a general look for now. So as in every GAN, we have our seed distribution here. So we have some noise sampled. 
right? Usually from a normal distribution. And we have a label here. So we can also see that this is actually a conditional GAN. And, and now we have a lot of the parts of our network. Uh, let's just uh, dissect this architecture into separate parts and then take a look at it all together at the end. Okay, so uh, let, let me take you back a little bit about the uh, composition mechanisms which are uh, applied in computer vision. So for example, there is one uh, task, computer vision, which is uh, all, it looks almost like segmentation, but it's not, it's image matching. So for example, if you have your images and you often want to like uh, separate your object from the background. And often you do this like in a binary way and it's mostly okay, but sometimes you want to uh, get more detailed information about the background. So you want to get uh, actual transparency of the object that you are dealing with. Uh, if you work with Photoshop or with another image editor, you know that you usually want to work with alpha channel. And if you want to like, for example, merge some images, you want to set this alpha channel, which describes a uh, relation between foreground and background for each image. And uh, sometimes we actually have these tasks in computer vision as well. So it's, it looks quite alike segmentation, but it's not. And what do we do in this setup? So uh, we actually introduce a composition mechanism, which uh, sets up a way which we want to combine foreground with background. And let's take a look at this example. So we can actually uh, separate uh, alpha channel for this image. Let's say this alpha channel and like get uh, our background information and foreground information. So this would be our foreground. And you can see that it has some floating values like less than one, but uh, still non-zero around the head. So, uh, and, and you can usually uh, know for a fact that for those models, the most complicated parts are usually with hair because we often want to separate uh, like people on the images. Even now we are using the zoom and like the zoom introduced this feature of uh, changing background on video without a green screen. So yeah, this is actually a matching problem. And as soon as we solve it, we can actually uh, use any background we want. So, and they, they look pretty, pretty fair. And actually uh, we can use the same, same exact mechanism to combine uh, parts of our generative pipeline. So at the very, very end, as you can maybe see already from the architecture, we have somehow our shape, our texture, and our background here. And they are all combined, like only two of them. So uh, they are combined together uh in uh, do with this exact like, composition framework to get the final image so actually we'll get to the way how do we get each of these modalities for us but seems like composition is quite straightforward and now we should mention the loss function so let's start with the final one so reconstruction loss would be uh uh, loss actually this would be l1 loss pixel wise uh, between images of the uh, generated image and ground truth and another loss we want to introduce uh, is loss uh, it's called a perception loss perception loss actually it comes from the paper authored by uh, one of the authors of computer vision course in Stanford. And actually, we not only we want to uh, our images to be closed pixel wise, we want them to have some meaningful 
like be close in terms of some meaningful distance between them. And how do we get this meaningful distance? Well, with neural network as usual. So we have some neural network here, which is uh, usually uh, when we deal with these metrics uh, related to neural networks, we use uh, nets like VGG. They seem to show themselves pretty proficient in terms of feature extraction, but like they are uh, rarely used as an end classifier uh, because of the number of parameters. But we, we usually use this pre-trained VGG network. And as you can see, we like cut it off at some depth. So uh, we have usually a convolutional layer. And if we have, if we choose the convolutional layer at the cutoff point, then we can take the mean between all its parameters and this will be our perception loss. And yeah, that's like, that's one of the general losses you use for image generation tasks combined with L1 loss in this case. So, okay, let's move on. Uh, and let's go for shape mechanism. So this is like a small preview of what it actually does. So in uh, this counterfactual networks, uh, share, we want to shapes to shapes to be generated separately. And to do so, we actually have two steps. Like we generate the image and this part will be done by some GAN. We go from that. And actually using this GAN, we do some segmentation as well. I'm sorry, spoiler alert. Well, uh, the question here might be, uh, does this thing uh, require fine tuning at all? And maybe one important uh, part that I forget to mention. So in this scheme, color of elements also have, uh, have meaning. So if some architecture, some weights here are colored green, so then they don't need fine tuning. So these weights we are using, which we are using are frozen. And the weights which are colored blue are actually fine tuned during our like training process. So if you, you can see that all units in our architecture are green, but we use the GAN uh, in separate in different setups. Sometimes we fine tune it and some, uh, sometimes we don't. So in the first, for the first loss function, reconstruction loss, we actually didn't uh, do any fine tuning and just used like big GAN uh, out of the box as the current state of the art or state of the art ish for our image visual generation. And yeah, and let's, let's go back here. Uh, and I should mention why, why did I, uh, get your attention on uh, the fact whenever we are actually training the weights. So if you, if you are following my like, story so far, actually, if I have decent image generator and I have decent uh, segmentation network, I can just generate an image and uh, like take, uh, like uh, run the segmentation for inference. And I already have the shape of my object. But there are some subtle moments here. First is that actually we can't, uh, we should use some universal segmentation like architecture. So it should be trained to uh, segment out some general object because we couldn't uh, like assume all the object, all the classes which we will have on inference. And this U2 network is trained U2 net trained exactly for that purpose, uh, but it has a downside. So with that in mind, when we have image generated by GAN, uh, it might be a little bit like it have some domain, might have some domain shift from the uh, like natural images. And this tend to uh, like uh, to influence uh, the quality of segmentation. 
So to smooth out like small errors in segmentation, uh, what we actually do, we actually fine tune this construction a little bit. So we fine tune our GAN uh, just to like make more reasonable, reasonable images for our U2Net to handle. And so let's take a look at this part. So we actually have this, uh, yeah, uh, we have this couple of networks working together. And let's take a little bit look into the architectures themselves. And then we will discuss the last function. So yeah, at some point, if you have any questions, just interrupt me, feel free. But uh, I'm going a little bit like expressively into details explicitly, uh, just so after hearing like this talk, you can implement the paper yourself if you want to. So the big GAN is like, so, uh, is one of the best GANs for visual generation for now. And we actually can use it with uh, like weights out of the box, but you should take into account when we see the GAN here, we're actually using only it only as a backbone. So we only take the generator part of a big GAN and like use it right away. So uh, yeah, usually when we, uh, have a GAN, uh, we, we mean generator combined discriminator, but this is not the case. We actually only use generator here, even for the training. And U2Net is kind of new, so it came out in 2020. And as you can see, it has like units, unit combined of the units. Uh, so idea and uh, up, like and the idea for this architecture to general intuition is that we want to capture some uh, like low level details without uh, constructing a network which is too deep. So this way we like we we do in progressive way as we do with UNet, but we still have a small units within each like scale. And so this has two, like two advantages. First advantage is that we are able to construct deeper models with fewer uh, parameters. And also um, maybe this is not exactly an advantage, but actually don't uh, have to use some backbone from uh, image classification for this. So. And sometimes it's really a blessing. So, and we will use UNET network for all our segmentation here, but we will always, always, always use some pre-trained weights for it. Okay, so moving on. Uh, yeah, we are still here and let's figure out our loss function. So this is a shape loss. And actually quite simple if you think about it. So you have uh, this binary loss, which is just like cross entropy loss between your like masks, but there's also mask loss and it is introduced here actually to prevent our mask prediction from collapsing into trivial cases. And trivial cases would be if I, let's say uh, if I generate an object which is like too large. So if I, uh, uh, so as, let's, let's discuss edge case. So for example, we always uh, generate uh, image masks which take the whole image and it will end up just generating images uh, just take images generated by big GAN and kind of taking the whole image. And that's not what we actually want here. So we have this penalty. And also it will help us to eliminate masks which are too, too thin actually. So it wouldn't fit 
like any object in it, but as an edge case, we like network will try to decide that uh, having a smaller object, it can have a smaller loss and kind of collapse into a local memo. And it's also isn't what we want. So I think we got through this part. And next, let's go for texture mechanism. So as you seen before, we had some way to generate the shape of our object, but uh, we also want to kind of feel texture of the object. So color it in some way. And you can see that sometimes it's hard to separate visually, right? But uh, one, one thing that you can see right away that uh, like foreground generation and the background separation are separate tasks because if we had them both handled so on, then on this image we had kind of uh, salient background, but we actually don't. And we not only we don't have it, we don't care. So if we have good enough texture on the image itself, we'll cut it out using, <clears throat> using our segmentation mask. Uh, the problem is how do we do that actually? So, uh, because uh, textures generated by big gun don't seem too realistic to be honest and we have to do something with it. So let's, let's think how, how do we get to this from our gun, gun generated textures. So uh, in terms of our whole uh, architecture, it is this part. As you can see, no, we don't introduce any new offensive backbones here, but seems to be some trick uh, regarding back, like big gun here. And big gun is still fine tuned. So what do we have? Actually, uh, it works like this. We have our GAN and we usually call like these images here, we call them pre-masks. So these are GAN generated images from which we infer our masks. Uh, and how do we actually get texture here? Uh, what we do here is we a crop, uh, like we separate our images into segments. Uh, so, and we actually only care about uh, parts of the image, which are in high intensity regions of our mask. So basically uh, colored white on this image. And they like group them into blocks as we do, for example, in contrastive learning such. And we kind of just use it as a puzzle, like we uh, uh, we permute them like among each other, and after this permutation, we just compute our loss. And this is actually would be still a saliency loss which we introduced before. So let's see how it looks. So uh, this is part of the training process. And we can see it as our foreground like evolves as we go through training process. And you kind of can guess that it, it like uh, injected these patches of the castle all over the image, but we still have, can have our castle here. And yeah, this is actually the same uh, perceptual loss as we used before. So we, we kind of have uh, like the correct textures in place, but we want the image itself to make sense. So now we don't use the L1 loss as we did before and use just perceptual loss here. So, and it, it gives us a texture and you can see like this image with the monkey looks quite uh, like to the image with the castle like in in manner which was generated. So, okay, now we have our shape and we have our foreground. And the only thing left here is actually a background. So as you can see on our skin. 
let's move on. So yeah, we were kind of here. And now uh, we'll develop some way to generate our background. And after combining them together, like combining these three things together, we have our images. So you can see different variations of the houses, uh, even nearly black and white because of the texture. And they, they look quite okay. But uh, if you take a look at backgrounds themselves, they they look like quite okay as well, just even without the object. And they seem to match uh, exactly the image which we're using uh, or approximately, but we'll, like, we should get the idea how to do that. And this is kind of a little bit tricky because uh, like if you had like a general problem like this, and I've told you that uh, you had some image, right? And you've been doing contribution a lot by this point, and you have some like, part of the image blacked out because we used it, like we masked it already with our network. Like basically what I would propose at this point, uh, why won't we just use any of the embracing techniques that we know. We can use neural networks or I don't know, even uh, k-nearest networks is used for embracing in some cases and just deal with it. Just it doesn't seem tricky. But in fact, it turns out that these approaches uh, take too long. So if you like would use like, straightforward embracing here, it would be almost like as difficult like as training the whole pipeline itself, it will still work, but it will like increase our training time and like have a lot of consequences. So uh, authors of this paper did something smarter. And yeah, what, what they actually did, uh, they said that let's just use the unit, which we already have, to separate the mask. Okay, that was kind of obvious. But then what they did, they decided to decrease the saliency of an image which we get. So uh, for if for for like foreground, like for, for the face for the shape, uh, if for the shape prediction we try to get some meaningful salient object, and it's in that color. Like here, let's do the opposite. Let's try to get object which is least salient here and which will have actually like blank segmentation masks in term, from the point of view of UNET. And uh, let's just take the objective of UNET, which is like, which is uh, almost cross entropy between the pixels, but a little bit more complicated because of the like, hierarchical structure. And this is just saliency in some way. And let's just minimize the saliency. So then we should negate our loss function. And yeah, it turns out that it gets our uh, like backgrounds uh, with relatively small effort and they look quite good. So I think this is a cool trick here as well. And as you could notice, we actually have all three parts of our network. Yeah. And we have this like huge loss function, which is just a linear combination of all losses which we have. So it would be reconstruction loss from here. And you can actually, like, I think quite easily uh, visually match all the losses to the, the general loss term. Uh, in the paper, you can find uh, uh, these alpha values, which was like just manually fine tuned. So some of them would be just 100 and they find it from parameter tuning, nothing really complicated here. Okay. And putting it all together, let's see how it works. So we kind of wanted in the beginning to uh, have a way to control individual uh, mechanisms of our factors of variations 
of the like generation process. And we turns out we achieved that. So we have uh, our pre-masks and our like, pre-masks, masks here. We have our foreground, right? And we have our background and we can see how our generated image evolves. Uh, there was there were some unexpected uh, features of this architecture. So for example, when segmenting out uh, an elephant, you can have errors like a lot of excessive legs. Uh, but since like the network is fine-tuned to separate a, like a single object, it usually goes with the most general shape of the object. So uh, like, re like reducing uh, variety in the masks, we actually uh, get rid of some unpleasant artifacts here for our fine-tuning process, which is fine. Uh, but yeah, it, more or less it works like expected. Okay. And yeah, then now we want to evaluate our generation in some meaningful way. And basically we want, we have uh, one way of evaluating our uh, like black box generative models or models without a latent, uh, like uh, latent dimension or explicit probability density. Uh, so it is an inception score. So what's, what's uh, I know that most of you already know this, but let's just do, like remind ourselves how it works. So idea is the following. So good generators generate images that are semantically diverse. So for example, uh, so we need to, uh, choose some semantic predictor for us. And then as usually we just use a neural network. And so this would be like probability distribution of our labels of the thousand classes given our image. And we have, uh, we want this probability like distribution have two, like two qualities. The first quality is uh, since uh, we usually want to generate a single image and it's maybe a little bit induced power by the data set which you already used for generation, but it's a single image, then if we have the single image and we have the distribution of let's say thousand classes, uh, we kind of want this distribution to have high entropy. So we want some class, some particular class to be highlighted in some discrete way, actually, more than the others. And the other property that we want, it's the property of marginal distribution. Well, we kind of want to uh, generate as diverse images as we can. So if we, so this was conditional distribution. And for the marginal distribution, we want something with actually high entropy, thousand classes. Ideally. And we have a way to do that. So let, let's define our inception model. Like this just gives us uh, like logics for our uh, input images. And we already looked at our marginal distribution and let's just uh, set inception score as a Kyle divergence between the marginal distribution and the uh, marginal distribution and our conditional distribution. So since we want these distributions to look quite different, uh, in contrast to usually, as we do usually minimizing Kyle divergence, we actually want to maximize Kyle, or like if we want to formulate it in another terms, we want to actually, uh, maximize this entropy and minimize this entropy. Well, there are like better, uh, like another approach is uh, similar to inception score as FID score and other developments. But the idea behind all this like network induced scores uh, are quite similar. Like but the central idea here is actually to use network as a semantic predictor. 
Yeah, the question is, can we really use our uh, like uh, inception score to evaluate our images? And the answer is, uh, well, kind of not. So because uh, like this, if we like generate images uh, and want them to be counterfactual images, counterfactual, they have will uh, lay on a different manifold than our usual data set is. So we can't like for counterfactual images directly, we can't use the metrics like inception score, but we can do some qualitative evaluation just by looking at them. So let's answer like, three main questions. And one of them would be, does, does this approach actually disentangle independent mechanisms? Let's, let's take a look at images that we got. And well, uh, the authors don't give you definite answer, but uh, it's mostly yes. So you can take a, take, take a look at any example. Let's say this one. So I can believe that each uh, factor of variation kind of checks out. So I can believe that this is a dog shaped uh, image and I can recognize background uh, as well as foreground. So it's kind of cool actually. And even to get you like more, like to flex out with the, uh, quality of the network. Uh, we can see some latent passes from latent direction in different uh, modalities. So we can even interpolate uh, for the shape, which looks quite cool, but uh, it isn't something that we didn't see before. But also we can interpolate for the uh, like foreground. Uh, I especially like this Jacob Lantern interpolation because uh it looks it goes through going like turning into like general vegetable because uh, before turning into cauliflower so and the same thing goes actually to the backgrounds so it seems like semantically it, it like it has some like meaningful uh meaningful representation. And like, if you, uh, if you are worrying about how do we actually do latent, like pass, how, how do we interpolate for the GANs? We actually have a lot of the seeds in our architecture at each step, each GAN has like this noise distribution, which is uh, actually multi-model because we have to pass it to, to each GAN. And in inference time, we, uh, we randomize those inputs and they allow us to go latent passes in distribution of these like noise dimensions here, here, and here. Okay. But uh, one of the reasons I like this paper is that authors actually introduce some failure cases for their networks. So for example, when you're trying to generate a relatively small objects, uh, sometimes uh, because of your segmentation procedure, part of your foreground texture uh, hits the background and it kind of gets multiplied with this background generation process and it becomes, becomes quite messy as you can see. So texture and background become uh, entangled, which we kind of assumed wouldn't help happen in the very beginning. And also there is another problem with objects which are too large since the object is too large and like segmentation uh, network cuts out most of the image. The background uh, like generation uh, didn't, uh, don't have quite enough data to fill in the empty spots. And sometimes you can see these artifacts of your previous objects in the image. So that's another case. And the third one is actually reduce realism. So do you remember those uh, like pre-maps which were generated by GAN? 
So actually, we are kind of starting off with perfectly good began and making it work a little bit worse because we want like, another mechanism to kick in. And sometimes it uh, leads to reduced realism of our images. Okay. So another question, uh, like which inductive biases uh, actually needed to achieve this entanglement? So uh, can we just like leave out some of the modalities and see how uh, how our inception score like, behaves? So uh, now we like, uh, we don't have to generate uh, counterfactual images, that's for sure. But we can just, uh, you know, uh, for, for our generation, we want to, uh, well, so well, we don't want to like compare it to, to general images. We just want to uh, like do some ablation study. And for, for this purpose, our inception score is good enough because we only want to compare relative performance. And doing so, we can see that uh, inception score goes up uh, like when we uh, leave out some like parts of our image, but we can be, we should be uh, like insightful about what we're actually doing here. Uh, because of that, we uh, also track mean value of our mask. And sometimes we, so this is a relative uh, value to the volume of the whole mask. And what, what happens here, what we actually experience here is we have quite large masks, uh, almost like one. And this is one of our mod collapses, uh, like, uh, collapse one of our collapse modes uh, where object is too large and we actually end up like just generating big gun uh, induced image without much change and of course it gets larger like uh, inception scores and so it does uh, in another mode collapse when we actually like leave out the whole image so yeah, so it seems like uh, collapsing modes uh, are not that good for our disentanglement because we just left out some modalities. But we can see that, uh, uh, like leaving out the shape, sometimes have some influence. And well, uh, it, it seems like there wasn't some. Uh, there wasn't some modality which didn't have any influence on our scores. So they all are kind of meaningful. Uh, we didn't skip any of them, like except of the collapse mode. So this is fine. But uh, to be honest, like going through this paper, uh, answer to this question is kind of tricky. So I didn't uh, have like a uh, decisive opinion about this entanglement here. But from the other point of view, so since the like factors of correlation are uh, like described explicitly here, it's trying not to achieve disentangle. So disentanglement is usually interesting for us in unsupervised mode. Okay, and yeah, I spend a lot of time drawing those masks, but actually you have like examples here. So this is our our two collapse modes. And you can see from left to right, this is how our uh, shape works, uh, looks in the beginning of training without any fine tuning. And then like for, for texture, and then it, this is the final, final segmentation maps. So yeah, uh, for, for the last part, and I think like the trickiest one, we should look into some uh, data sets which were uh, explicitly introduced for causal learning. So uh, there are some MNIST variations uh, which actually like 
change the texture of the NIST images. Sometimes they use colored foregrounds. Sometimes they change both background and foreground color. And sometimes they use some texture. And yeah, just, just visually, we kind of nailed that. Although for foreground generation, we, not, we don't always like have very diverse foregrounds for for numbers themselves, but come on, this is a NIST. And actually, it would be not that interesting our performance on MNIST, but uh, we, I think the data set introduced, is introduced in paper because it's actually the only way to compare the results to previous results in causal classification. So there are actually two like causal classification baselines. Uh, this is, I think, learning not to learn. And this is uh, IRM. I, I don't remember how it described precisely, but so IRM should be trained with different environments. Uh, I think the environments here are like colored masks for uh, MNIST foreground and background. This is why for colored MNIST, we only have two environments. And for like double colored MNIST, we, we can for five environments and for wildfire mist as well. And yeah, uh, and this is uh, another baseline, which is also like quite obvious. Uh, why don't we augment our training data set with just some GAN generated images? So this is original plus GAN, and this is kind of our solution. So we see that we have some major improvements on the test accuracy uh, in all cases, uh, which like doesn't uh, mean that much since MNIST is quite simple, but since the margin is, is, is large, uh, it's quite pleasant. Uh, also, uh, for if we want to run a similar benchmark on more meaningful images, we should remember stylized ImageNet paper I think we uh, discussed it on last ICLR review one year before prior to that. But actually the idea of the paper was that uh, like modern uh, image classifiers are biased towards the texture. And so to explore that bias and actually measure it in some way, uh, in this paper, they used some iterative uh, style transfer procedure just to like swap the texture of each image, trying to preserve its shape. And they introduced the styled ImageNet uh, dataset. And from styled ImageNet dataset, they also uh, got this Q conflict dataset, which you usually only see in the causal classification paper. So how does it actually work? So uh, since the data set here is synthetic and you have some texture, like real texture here, and you run it through your uh, classifier, get like classification outputs for the texture itself. And you have a uh, image of the content, so object itself. And you kind of uh, fuse them together through st like style transfer. And you can see how log it's actually changed. And like in the Q conflict data set, they wanted like uh, when they generated uh, this kind of data sets, like subsets, they wanted to evaluate uh, to pin some number for to each data set. So for, for each data set, they wanted to add some number uh, which uh, described uh, like uh, degree of correlation between shape and uh, like uh, between the shape of the image and its label. So uh, they did it quite easily. They just counted the number of uh, like logits uh, uh, which are correlated with content image. In that case, they told that uh, this image is like highly correlated by shape. And if it m correlated mostly with texture image, they can like pin 
they can say that image is correlated by texture. So using this conflict data set technique, we kind of for all our data sets, uh, synthetic data sets, we can evaluate our shape biases. Uh, and yeah, so, sometimes like this is uh, like image net, sometimes uh, like they use some augmentation to evaluate those things for original image net. So they did it for image net, synthetic image net and mix up of the two. And they also could like evaluate our data sets this way. Uh, so uh, what did we do? We actually uh, used, uh, going through the first example, we used our classification network like with three different heads. So one would be responsible for the shape and two others uh, like for the foreground and the background. And we kind of uh, allowed them to draw their like own labels for each image for classification. And then we just use them as ensemble to, to get our final uh, label. So as you can see, uh, like from the paper uh, about uh, like uh, style stylized image net, uh, like stylized image net kind of introduced, uh, like help to get rid of texture bias, which she believed to notice in image net. So there's a large gap here. And we can also see to the uh, degree of texture bias in our, uh, like, let, let's look at the shape bias, just it's clear shape bias in our heads of our ensemble. So we see that the shape bias is quite larger in our shape-based classification head. But even though uh, we have like those heads are quite, like have quite different opinions on the shape, their overall performance on, uh, like ImageNet isn't that bad compared to baseline. So we kind of managed to disentangle this representation uh, without significant loss in accuracy, which is fine for us. Uh, yeah, also here's another paper uh, which allows us to evaluate how much our classifier prediction is correlated with the background. And this is also paper used for causal correlation evaluations. So it is also synthetic data set. We just have separate uh, like modes for each image. Sometimes we miss out the uh, like object on the image. As you can see, uh, if, if the label is highlighted green, it was correctly classified by our ImageNet classifier and if it's red, it did it made an error. So we can leave on the background uh, by some artificial augmentation or we can just mask out the foreground. And there are like two modes which are uh, interesting for us in particular. So uh, it's mixed same mode. In, in this mode, we swap the background, but with some consistent background. So uh, let's say we like eliminate this uh, background from a butterfly image, but we swap in the background from another butterfly image. And in mixed rand, we kind of create a counterfactual image and we like, put our butterfly underwater or something. And BG gap net uh, like uh, metric kind of evaluates this gap between performance on these two data sets. And we want to like, close this gap. So, and also like in nine is ImageNet nine, ImageNet nine data set, uh, which has only nine classes. And those classes were like selected in a way that the uh, gradients would be far apart. So it would be like, like fish and bird. I don't remember all the classes, but uh, this was the, the principle. And let's see how actually uh, 
like ImageNet classifier does on uh, on a data set uh, like generated by a counterfactual network and some others. So as we can see, the gap is quite small compared to baselines, but we didn't manage to close the gap as well as like, uh, training on this mixed rand uh, subset, which was this. And yeah, this uh, I think we'll discuss this a little bit later in the conclusion. Yeah, and this is a conclusion. So uh, let's discuss what we achieved with this uh, architecture, what's good for. So the first point we're trying to make uh, is that uh, the composition mechanism itself is a powerful bias. So uh, we induced our composition bias by using uh, like U2 net network. And as we saw in some uh, fail examples, like uh, we, do, we do not do well actually on small objects and large, large objects. And this is mostly due to the bias, which was introduced by our composition. So uh, our approach isn't that general at all. Also, also as we saw from the last benchmark, uh, augmenting the images data set with those generated images, uh, like it, it has some meaningful qualities to it. Uh, like it adds some qualities in terms of uh, decorrelating network outputs with the data, but it's not actually, it's not good enough to improve performance on the ImageNet benchmark. Uh, yeah, this is true. And I actually, uh, I didn't see anything, like I, I saw some approaches which used generative like models to augment the data set, which claim uh, to get better performance in the end. But I like from my experience, I didn't trust in them uh, that well, and this is another reason which why I trust this paper. It seems like believable to me, and uh, yeah, that's a good point. But to be to be fair, the uh, even like other baselines, as using other GANs or other genetic models as augmentation, can't actually like break through uh, ImageNet performance. So it for now, I think the only uh, actually working way to do this is like doing some excessive uh, like, uh, deterministic augmentations. That's another point. And the third point actually is mostly related to the uh, like qualities which are related to representation disentanglement. And one major assumption we had here is that the causal mechanisms are independent and we discussed it at the beginning. But another assumption is that we actually know the causal mechanism. So we fixed out uh, factors of variation, which was like shape and foreground and background. And I think it simplifies our task uh, significantly. So uh, what we want, usually what we want to compute image, image perception to get like high level understanding of the data it receives. And this, this was like a major hint. So if we compare this to works in representation disentanglement, uh, there actually isn't much of a challenge doing this in a uh, supervised way, or at least in a way where we know the factors of disentanglement. Uh, compared to unsupervised setup. So this is uh, another point to make. But yeah, uh, in general, I think this is like one of the examples where we mostly try to answer our academic questions, like get deeper insights into how, uh, how our like, science work and compared to trying to achieve some better margin on some uh, like benchmark for some applied task, which is also important, but it, I think it's mostly important to uh, apply the research and maybe even engineering. 
And now not only we try to go deep into deep understanding, I think I want to highlight that even though this is an academic paper, it's very uh, like well written and like implementation choices are quite smart here. So uh, the architecture which we end up, ended up with uh, could be actually fine tuned on a single uh, 1080 GPU using some pre-trained weights, which is awesome. And you can try this out. And uh, it, this, this is mostly due to the tricks uh, which were made by the authors. So for example, uh, the clever streak with impacing doing the saliency reduction instead of going uh, with straightforward way and doing some you know, gun based in painting. Uh, yeah, so I think that's it. Uh, paper for today. Uh, if you like, feel like you have any questions uh, after the presentation you want to discuss, just hit me anywhere. Uh, you can even like send me a link to your whole code on GitHub. I'll be happy to take a look if you decided to reproduce the paper, which authors uh, claim to have published, but I went through the link and it only has abstract there. Maybe they will do it shortly. Yeah, but I think that's it. Uh, thank you for your time. And like, I'm happy to answer your questions if you have one.